Hello, this is Meredith Monk. So that was fantastic. I really love that. Thank you. Um, how did you learn to do that? <laughs> uh, I didn't learn. I've just, uh, well, I had this kind of revelation. Uh, well, should I go to the history of my life? Please. Okay. So I'm a fourth generation singer in my family. My mother was the original Muriel Cigar on the radio and Blue Bonnet Margarine and Schaefer Beer. She sang jingles and she was on radio, you know, or even before the jingles, she was doing more the hit of the week, you know, on the radio. I have wonderful recordings of her. And my grandfather came from Russia and was a bass baritone and was pretty much a cantor in New York, but also sang in church and also had a music conservatory. I remember him very well. I remember his voice. <laughs> I remember his voice very well. And apparently his father was a cantor. Uh, so, um, you know, singing was second nature to me, and they told me that I sang before I talked, really. Then trying to find a place in a singer's family is a little difficult, so I was also, uh, I have a um, strabismus, I don't see three dimensions, so, you know, my eyes work independently, and so my mother knew, found out about Dalcro's Eurythmics, because I think she felt that I was rhythmically and musically it was pretty natural for me, but my coordination wasn't very good. And I think, it, you know, if she heard that it was like a kind of way of combining music and the body. Uh, so all the other kids were learning music through their bodies, but I was learning my body through music, really. And that integration meant so, I, re, I never realized how much it meant to me until I, until I made Atlas and I was working with a lot of classically trained singers. Uh, and they and their, my rhythmic articulation is very different than the Western tradition, and they're not taught to have that rhythmic kind of precision and articulation. It's more line, you know. That's a Western European tradition, and so they, you know. And I think of rhythm as more cyclical, uh, you know, a more it would be have more in common with Indian music, actually, you know, long cycles, and then you can come back to the one. So they'd say, "How are you getting back to the one?" I, I was like, "I have no idea." You know, I mean, it's, I, it's so intuitive for me. And they said, oh, it's a Dow Crows training. So what happened was that I, I, so I was dancing my whole childhood, which I always consider, um, I consider that that has made me healthy as a human being. It was never natural for me. It was really hard. Um, but I think the movement really helped me get to my voice because then in, I went to Sarah Lawrence. I was in the voice department. I was singing leader and... I was folk singing my way through Sarah Lawrence to earn my way singing at children's birthday parties with my guitar. And I was in the dance department. I was making dance compositions. So I was finding my own idiosyncratic way of making movement composition because I had you know, a lot of challenges and limitations, which was a good thing because I found my own style in movement. And then I had a revelation after I, after I left Sarah Lawrence, I came to New York, I was doing more solo gestural pieces, a little voice work, but not so much, and I missed it. And so I sat down at the keyboard and just started vocalizing, regular Western European vocalizing, and I had this revelation that the voice could be like the body, that first of all, I, I didn't have to deal with text particularly. I mean, I loved as a folk singer to do characters and everything. It wasn't that I didn't like words, but I, I trust the nonverbal thing more to get deeper, and so that I could use the same method that I would do as a choreographer going into the studio and working with my body to find a movement, that I could do that with my voice, but because my voice had a much more range to begin with and I had my instrument had more virtuosity to begin with, I just used my same methodology. So I don't, didn't learn to do anything, I just worked to find what my voice could do. And then I also had the feeling that I could get, have male and female within it. I could have animal, vegetable, mineral, uh, you know, landscapes, uh, you, know, pers you know, and that it was a, I got the sense that it was a very ancient instrument and that it had a lot of primordial kind of power. So I got very interested in what was early utterance. And then it was my way of coming back to my own family, but on my own terms, I felt. You know, because it was always hard. My, you know, my mom was quite content, competitive as a person, and uh, boy, I remember doing these leader recitals in Sarah Lawrence. I was just, I'd be, fr you know, flipping out with nerves, which I still have nerves now to this day, but I mean, but you know. 
is a little debilitating. So, so that's how I learn. I, so I, I, I'm still learning. You know, that's a, that's a beautiful thing about doing a life where you love what you do. There's all kinds of things I'm finding in my voice to this day that I haven't done before. I think that's the really interesting thing about it is the, the openness and the kind of invitation to things in the world. And to me, it's interesting that you say that um, you came to New York after college and you went into, um, you were mostly working in dance. I was working movement. in galleries yeah. and I was, you know, doing really kind of site specific work. I was always interested in space. Strangely enough that I don't see three dimensions, but I always work in space. And I think of my music as very much in space. Um, but I wasn't doing, I was doing more gesture, a little bit of voice, but I missed the straight out singing. And so I actually went back to it mm, in my own way. So you mentioned um, Atlas, which just had a um, spectacular performance in Los Angeles, which was amazing. Um, uh, I wonder if you can say something about the challenges of working with, um, with um, singers who don't come through, uh, who come from a straight mm -hmm. Western background and have to um, adjust to you, and maybe even say something about um, how pieces like this are taught. You know, how I, I know that you've worked with um, Katie and Allison for um, a very long, time, very long time, but how is a piece like Cellular Songs um, learned? Ah, so that's two different, very different it's questions. It's two very yeah. different questions. So, um, with, a, with Atlas, was a so in my early ensemble, so I did a lot of solo pieces first for a, year, a number of years. And I was working more with actors and dancers and they were doing, uh, I was really doing most of the music myself. Like my piece, uh, Vessel, I was at the organ almost the whole time singing and, or I'd do very simple choral things for them because they were more actor, dancer people. Um, and then I got, and then when I did Quarry, uh, which is an opera about World War II, I auditioned and I had 28 young people who were really good singers. I wanted really good singers and really good mo strong movers. And it was so inspiring. I could get all these textures that I couldn't do myself, you know, that, you know to get the more compositional complexity. And so I chose the three strongest female singers and I made Tablet, which was the first piece I made with four parts that were of equal complexity and, and virtuosity because the range, you know, all of us have, you know, almost a four octave range at that time. And, um, and then I start, then I wanted to um, really understand more about men's voices, so I made Dolman music, which is, was for six people. Um, and so these young people that were with me at that time, they grew up with me in a sense, you know, and they also came, not, not all of them were great movers, but they, they, movement was kind of part of it. And I always think that what I do is, uh, the dancing voice and the and the singing body. That's what I do, you know. I mean, that's what I, you know, that the voice dances. And so, they they grew up on my vocabulary. They were all really good singers, but they were not hung up on any level in terms of the classical backgrounds. So they just kind of came along with me in my exploration. So then, when I did Atlas, it was a matter of auditioning some op opera trained singers. I had. I think three or four people from my ensemble that were in the piece, but I needed 18 singers. So, well, what we, <laughs> I took a year to audition, and I didn't, the usual audition is people come in and they sing their aria, you know, and then, uh, you know, next. So I don't never have liked that. I really like to give back in an audition. So what I do with my auditions is I literally teach a workshop. So they were three or four hour workshops for maybe 15 singers, and I heard about 300 people. And that's how I met Katie. She came to the audition. I was like, oh, yeah, I like her. You know? so, they, so I give them movement warm-up. I give them a vocal warm-up. We do a classical, you know, complicated canon because I need to see whether they can part sing. So a lot of people that come from opera can't. They're not used to it. You know? And um, then I did some little bit of rhythmic improvisational things to see you know, whether they could be free. You know, just all kinds of things. And then I also looked, was looking for radiant, generous human beings, because who wants to go on tour with creepy divas, you know? I've been on that tour. Yeah, well, I don't want to. <laughs> so, div divos and divas. So, um, and I just got this radiant, gorgeous cast, and a lot of people are still like, you know, all the singers I've ever worked with in my life are still family to me. And then for the Atlas in LA, it was uh, Yuval Sharon's production, who's a young opera director. That was the first time I'd ever let someone else direct it. 
It was hard, though, and it was, I love what he did on some levels, some things I was sad about, you know, so that's the first time, and I don't know I, whether I would do it again, I'm not sure. Because the way that I worked on Atlas was I was working on all the elements together. I, was, I worked on the music, I was working on the gesture, I was working on the characters, I was working on the visual thing. It's whole to me, it's like a whole piece of fabric. So this was like taking the music apart and then let someone, someone else visualize it. And I adore him and you know, um, and I mean I really see why people really, you know, loved it and I felt very proud of the music. You know, I could sit in that audience and go, wow, that music still holds up, you know. I, that, so that was great, you know, on a certain level. And I was just exploring what's it like to be an opera composer, you know, where somebody else does, I never understood it where someone else visualizes your vision or does, you know, it was really wild, but it was also great to go, God, the music still holds up. You know, it was kind of wonderful on one level. So with that cast, we did the same process. You know, we just did these long auditions and I chose young, radiant singers. And they did a great job. Um, would you be open to having some questions? Sure. Are there some questions? And we have a microphone coming around, I think, so. I didn't answer the second part of your question, but we'll That's do that tomorrow night. O opera is a very loaded word. Uh, how would you define it? I called my pieces opera since, uh, since 1971 when I did a piece called Vessel, which was, I called an opera epic. And opera, and it was literally an opera epic. It took place in three different spaces. I rented a bus for the audience and, and moved them from one space to another. So it was literally an epic and it was epic in scale. But I think why I always chose opera in my work for many, many years, uh, you know, Quarry's an opera, you know, uh, The Games is an opera, uh, opera, because I always feel that opera has this wonderful potential of integrating all the perceptual modes and, you know, integrating it into one form. And I really, you know, truly believe in that, not only as an aesthetic that I've always had, and it's kind of a necessity, because I think my, um, having these different interests as a child and how do I weave them together? Even at Sarah Lawrence, I was trying to make these overall kinds of pieces. Also as a psychic kind of health, you know, as an integration of my being, you know, in a way. Um, but I think that, you know, that, that the potential of that uh, multi, multi-perceptual, multi-dimensional kind of form is still you know, so exciting to me. And that's why I called it opera. Any more? Is there a vocal technique or vocal possibility that you've encountered or imagined that you would like to incorporate into a piece but haven't succeeded in doing so yet? That's interesting. I mean, some people, I feel like people misunderstand my work in, in a little bit because they hear sounds that might remind them of a technique from a different place or something like that. And that's actually not how I get to it. I actually get to these through working on my own instrument and then come across sounds that you know, I, I, what I always say is each of our voices is totally unique, and yet we're all part of the world vocal family. So, so I can't think of anything particularly, and also, I always have a hard time with the codification process. Um, you know, it, to me it's like, well, you put a little glottal break here, and then you put a little goat trill here. I, even the name goat trill, I mean, that's not, you know, and then you put it together, bibbity bobbity boo it's like a recipe or something like that. Whereas I feel like, um, when I'm really performing well, it's coming through me. I wouldn't even be able to put my finger on like a technique. I mean, I, you could analyze it that way, but I don't even think of it in those terms. I think of it more like, it's gonna sound, you know, kind of hokey, but you know, almost spirits coming through me or something like that, you know, and uh, more sound palettes. And each piece, each piece I try to find the sound world that it needs. So I, so far I haven't found that yet. Um, I mean, I, you know, um, a lot of my process is listening to what something needs, you know, and just trusting. It's very scary for me every time. I'm terrified, you know, every time I make a piece. I'm not gonna tell you how old I am, but I've been working over 50 years and I'm still terrified every time. But I think probably that's part of the process of, 
if you didn't care that much, like I always think of Margot Fontaine, she said, now if you didn't get nervous, then you should be, get really nervous. <laughs> you know, so, and that always helps me when I'm shaking in the back there. But even in terms of making a piece, like, you know, to jump off into the unknown, the beginning is always pretty scary for me. And I think of it more like a detective, like I'll get, I'll be at the piano and like I'll find one little thing that I haven't heard before, I haven't done be before, because I'm trying to start risk starting from zero, not doing what I've done before. And then I might find one little phrase or something like that and I go, oh yeah, and then that's a clue. And then that leads me to the next clue. And then pretty soon the, my curiosity kind of takes over my fear. And when that happens, I know I'm on the right path. And then I get super interested and then the fear kind of goes. Mm -hmm. I think also that's very um, personal. Mm -hmm. Like I always think that these things are investigations of yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, and one of the reasons why the, the music is so um, emotional for me mm -hmm. when I hear it is because it seems like it's emotional for you. You know, mm -hmm. like, like these, um, the sounds are, are you trying to figure out like the, the totality of who you are. Hmm. I don't think of me in there at all, actually. It's funny because I had a wonderful interview with, uh, did you ever know Jamaki Highwater? So Jamaki Highwater was a kind of, he was a cultural critic. He wrote a beautiful book called The Primal Mind. And I remember when I read that, I was like, oh, this is somebody who understands my work, you know, I underst understands how I'm working. So he was Native American, but was, was adopted by uh, uh, European, you know, Western European, so he had Western European education. Um, and he, you know, pointed out, for example, that in the Western European tradition, music was turning into a visual medium because of the scores. In the, you know, primordial Native American tradition, it's still sound. So, um, and we had this wonderful interview, and, and you know, sometimes I, I would do these solo pieces, and they, people would say, oh, that must be about you and about your autobiography, and I was like, Jamaki said, Meredith, your work, the last thing that you do is about you, and I was like, you're absolutely right. It's not, um, it's not me, it's about trying to do something universal. You know, as Maybe much if as I, I think it's about you, it makes it possible for me to think it's about me. Exactly. You know, I've, 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 I, I, right, no, no, that, that makes total sense because I've always said that sometimes the most personal is the most universal. So it might be that you're getting that, but that allows you to get to that place that we all have. But it's man, as I said, each of our voices are different, so it manifests in a unique way, but we're part of the world family. Mm -hmm. So one more question, or have we done it? There's I'm curious about how you build your piece. When, you're, when you talked about your first piece, when you were out in the desert and you were building that yes. piece, yes. it seems like it took several days, or yes. I'm just wondering how you built it from one day to the next if there's not a yes. set notation. It must yeah. have a lot of memory involved. Well, that I think in those days, I mean, now I use a little bit more notation, and Allison does a lot of my really good transcriptions because, you know, uh, the computer, I don't see very well, so the computer is really hard for me. And even my notation, it's like, okay, it's sort of like a six-year-old, but, but, but it's because I can't line it up very well with my eyes, you, you know what I'm saying? But uh, in those days, at, when I was working on Songs from the Hill, it was more coming, um, my task to myself. So I had been working on voice and organ a lot. I had finished Vessel, and I wanted to go back to the acapella voice. So my sister lived in New Mexico, and I would sit on this hill in the hot sun, and my only goal that day was to come up with a little piece of material. And I had a little teeny-weeny tape recorder, and then I came back east, and then I made my forms. So a lot, of, a lot of the way that I work is very intuitive to come up with material, but then it's pretty the other side of the brain to make my forms, because I love form very much. You know, like um, I just this summer did a, a, sang a set with Bobby McFerrin uh, in New Mexico, because we had done uh, a set in the late 80s. He, wa he wanted to be in a concert of mine at BAM, and we had a hard time because I, can improvise, I mean, I could improvise, but I'm not so interested in that. I actually like form. You know, I'm very, still very interested in form. And he, 
does not, he wants to completely improvise. He, he wants, he said the more information he has, the worse it is for him. So we improvised for about three days and I said, well, when are we gonna rehearse? He said, see you next November. I was like, what? You know, like, and so we, we I called the, uh, the set uh, duet behavior and um, so we kind of compromised. So we did one that we called Clean Slate, which wasn't, straight improvisation, but I said he had to start. And then I made another piece called Dependent Song, which was, I wanted to hock at it with him, and he didn't want to rehearse that much, so we just did it in unison. So so last summer, uh, he was in New Mexico. I have land out there, and that's where I really work. And he had heard that I was out there, and so he asked if I would sing with him. And I decided to just let go and go into his world, because it was so good to see him again. And, you know, we're old now. <laughs> And, you know, it just was so poignant. And so I did go completely into his improvisational thing. And it was really great, and I loved it, but I realized that I'm, I still love putting the bricks down. You know, I love that building thing. So I love structure. And so it just, I just am very labor intensive. And sometimes I work alone well, I always work alone, but then I'll go into rehearsal with my materials, almost like paints. And then I make it like in the, you know, start working on structure in rehearsal so I can actually hear it and, you know, sort of build that way and then go back alone again. You know, so it, it's kind of, um, it's very alive. And then at the same time, it, I don't sit and just write from beginning to end. I, I would go crazy. So it's, it's a people thing and it's also a building thing. Mm -hmm. Meredith, thank you very You're much. You're so welcome. Thank you.